Well, welcome once again, my fellow biblical explorers. Welcome to another episode of Table Talks. And in this episode, we're continuing our study into the book of Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls. And this uh, episode, uh, we're looking at chapter four, the opposition to the rebuilding of those walls. Now, before we get into the study of this chapter four, let's read it together in God's word. So, Get out your Bible or that fa that Bible app and your favorite cup of coffee, and let's read God's Word together, shall we? We're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 4, and we're going to be reading from the NIV version. It says this, Now, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the armies of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Amorite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even if a fox climbed upon it, he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back in on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Amorites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. There's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes." When our enemies heard that, they, we, that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind the people of Judah. These people were building the wall. Who, Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the word of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued to the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of the dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay in inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither, neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had a weapon even when he went for water." Well, my friends, what a glorious thing God's Word is, isn't it? We're looking at God's Word today, and we are studying the life work of one of the greatest characters in the Bible, Nehemiah. Nehemiah had courage and, de and determination in the face of the fiercest opposition. He had complete faith in God and a passion for serving his Lord, but he was a man oppressed. The story of the fourth chapter of Nehemiah is thrilling indeed. 
so often the work of the Lord and, and in the work of the Lord, immediately following a time of blessing, the enemy comes in with a counterattack. You see, Satan does not like it when God's soldiers gain the upper hand and when we gain ground, as it were. So the enemy, the devil, will launch a counterattack. One of the many tools in his arsenal is that of discouragement. And we know this so well, don't we? My friends, so many times Donette and I have experienced times of refreshing and encouragement in our ministry, only to be followed by some bad news or some backbiting talk in the church. And then Satan launches his counterattack of discouragement. Over the years, Donette and I have come to realize where this is actually coming from, and we take it to the Lord in prayer, and then we go on in our service to the King of Kings. If we had not done this, we, had be, we would have been sidelined out of the battle a long time ago. Someone once said, What a difficult disease to cure. I don't know of anything that will take the wind out of your sails quite so quickly as discouragement. Rare is the person who can resist it. Now, if you remember from the very beginning of this book, at first everything seemed to be going tremendously well. Nehemiah had come as the cupbearer to the king. He'd asked the king to be sent to his hometown of Jerusalem, which was burnt down and derelict, and to be, to be allowed to build it. Not only did he ask the permission, but he asked for resources, and the king gladly gave all that he needed. So Nehemiah went to Jerusalem with all the resources he needed. And we remember that we followed Nehemiah as he prayerfully surveyed the ruins and as he thought and meditated before God about what to do as he rode around the walls. Remember last time, riding around the walls and the gates? He prayerfully meditated upon this, and it wasn't too long until he had an army of workers all around all around him that had, had a heart and a head to do the work. They really wanted to work to rebuild the city of God. But so often in the work of the Lord, immediately following a time of blessing, the enemy comes in with a counterattack. The enemy keeps coming again and again and again to discourage us from doing the work of the Lord. Now, the opposition that we are looking at in this first uh, half of this chapter was the opposition of Sanballat, Tobiah, and, and Geshem, and a number of their friends, and even some of their enemies. These people all united together in opposition to the work of God. But up till now, they were able to keep that opposition at bay. They were able to deal with it, and the people facing those enemies, they were overcomers. The people had a mind to work. They had a heart to pray, and we saw that they had an eye to watch, and they overcame. Now, there were foes, too, uh, that were facing them here. There were external foes in the presence of Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Amorites, and the, man, the men of Ashdod, and we see that in chapter 4, verse 7. But they had an internal foe as well, and that was seen in the present presence of discouragement, and that's seen in chapter 4, verses 9 to verse 12. Anybody who is engaged in the work of the Lord will face two foes. They will face an external foe and an internal foe. Here is Nehemiah, who's unmistakably called by God. He's commissioned by the king and having secured an army of helpers to, do, to, to work upon rebuilding the wall, who now finds himself faced with discouragement of every possible kind. And Judah said, up to this point, we've had the Amorites and the Ashdodites and the Arabians send Balat, Tobiah, and Geshem. But now in verse 10, could you almost, you almost could miss it. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so we are not able to build the wall. Oh, my goodness. Nehemiah's own people were starting now to rise opposition. Why couldn't the rubbish just stay the way it has always been? It's always been like that. Why do we have to change it? Why should we be building to the glory of God anyway? Now, we're not told what Nehemiah felt like, but I can just imagine that he would have been sickened. He would have had a sickening sense of being let down. He must have been feeling overwhelmed by the feelings of betrayal. He was trying to lead the people of God, and at first they were all around him. But all of a sudden, they had given up. They had given in to the jibes of the enemy. 
and now all they wanted to do was to throw down their tools and give up. My friends, how persistent Satan the enemy is, and there's no doubt about that because we read that ten times in verse 12, then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn they will attack us. Satan loves to discourage the servants of the Most High God. Alan Redpath, in his book on Nehemiah, said these words, and I think they're so profound. What a powerful weapon is this which the enemy thrusts into our souls, this internal discouragement when the cream of the army, army threatens desertion, when the prayer partners have become discouraged, when the fellow missionary threatens to return home because it's too tough at the station, when those who should be sharing the burdens most deeply with the Nehemiahs of our time have no vision at all. How disheartening it is when those who should be right in the thick of the fight in real prayer warfare are men and women without any vision, without any burden. They will do the same job and carry on the same work as, as they've done for years, but they do not seem to be capable of real hard travail. Those who would be prayer partners think the task is just too much to handle. We just can't do it. Now, I'm trying to echo a cry that's perhaps in your heart today in the work that you've been called and doing for the Lord, or maybe in your own everyday domestic work at home, or your work at the office, or wherever you find yourself, you're just too discouraged. There is something that cries out from your heart, I can't do it anymore. I can't take it anymore. I'm overwhelmed. It's got too much for me. And you want to walk away. Sometimes you just want to run away from it all. My fellow biblical explorers, I'm being totally dis, dis, uh, transparent with you today when I say I've been there. During these days of COVID, the enemy has come in so many times with the weapon of his warfare or discouragement and has sought to bring Donette and I down. There have been days of discouragement and sadness, but realizing where this is coming from and taking to the Lord in prayer, we have received his encouragement over and over again. We have received his peace over and over again. For greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. I can say hallelujah to that. I'm living that. Donetta and I are living that today. Well, Nehemiah did not, that, did not have this, that word retreat in his language. Let me share with you three things that were the source of Nehemiah's discouragement and then quickly go over four things that were the secret of his encouraging, the origins and the answer to discouragement. Well, here's the first thing that uh, their strength was depleted. They couldn't do the work for God anymore, not just from a spiritual perspective, from, from a physical one. The actual Hebrew origin of the word means stumbling, tottering, staggering under a load. You can also, you can almost see them drain so much physically that they couldn't actually carry the bricks anymore. They were falling down on the load. They were tottering back and forth. Now, please see this distinction that I'm going to make now. They were so busy building, so busy building the, the walls of the city to, to protect the city that they forgot to build up their own walls to protect themselves. What a lesson there is in that for us all today. We're not talking here now about spiritual strength. We're talking about physical strength. Sometimes you can start a work for God strong, but you can't finish it because you're just too tired. Now, there's something we all have to remember Whatever capacity we're in doing the work for the Lord, it's this. When you become saved, you don't, be, you don't become Superman or Superwoman. You're still physical flesh and blood that needs sleep and needs food and needs all sorts of rest and even recreation. But equally, when we, we also have to remember that the servants of God individually, who we might see as called by God, they are not Supermen or Superwomen either. No individual, whether they be pastor missionary, evangelist, an elder in the church, a Sunday school teacher, a young people's leader. No one person ought to shoulder the burden physically of all the work of God. That is why 
It's the Lord's ideal that we are a body, a body of people who would carry the whole strain of the work. Secondly, their vision disappeared. Now we know from chapter 4 and, and in chapter 4 and verse 6, if you look at it, that they were halfway. They were halfway there. So we built the wall and all the wall was joined together onto the half. For the people had a mind to work. They were at the halfway stage of the building of the walls. And perhaps we could say that the halfway task of anything, especially the work of God, is sometimes the hardest place to be. And here's the third thing. Their confidence was deflated. Their strength was depleted. Their vision disappeared. And their confidence was deflated. Now, remember reading that verse in, in verse 6, the Hebrew literally says they had a heart to work, but their heart had been buried underneath the rubble. They had lost the heart for work. Their motivation was gone, and in place of it was a feeling of overwhelming defeat and even fear. Well, let's look now briefly at the four things that were the secret of their encouragement. Well, firstly, Nehemiah gave them a common goal, a common goal. When Nehemiah looked, he saw that the families were broken up. One part of the family was at one side of the wall, and another part was at the far end. And all that he could see was that the work was scattered. It was counterproductive because father and mother, brother and sister, weren't able to give moral support to one another and encouragement because they were so far apart. So what Nehemiah did was he recognized the work. He teamed up the people into the same families, the same neighbors, uh, neighbors around one common goal. Gold. Gold. One, one of the reasons why we get discouraged in the work of God is because the church of Jesus Christ, whether locally or globally, is split up. My friends, we need each other. Remember what we were talking about last week and the, the two things that uh, we, we, we must never say as Christians? I don't need you <laughs> and you don't need me. My friends, I'm telling you this morning, that's hogwash. We need each other. Do we have a common goal to see the work of the Lord Jesus Christ built up, to see people saved for him? Do we have that common goal above all other desires, whatever they may be? If we do, then we need each other. Well, secondly, in verse 14, they had a unified focus. Nehemiah says, after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Now, Nehemiah surveyed the rubble, the rubbish, and the debris, but it goes on to say that he didn't just focus on the rubbish around him. He lifted up his eyes heavenward, as it were. He encouraged the people not only to focus upon the rubbish and the dereliction that was around them too, but not to focus on the enemy, because if they did, there'd be no progress at all, but look to the Lord. Someone once said, if you don't like the outlook, then try the uplook. <laughs> they looked to Jesus. My friends, how we need to look to Jesus if we are going to guard against discouragement in our own hearts. You see, if we look to other Christians, we're, they're going to let us down. We're going we're to be discouraged. If we look to ourselves, we're going to be let down and we will be discouraged. But if we look to the Lord, that's what David did. He encouraged himself in the Lord, and that's what Nehemiah did. I wonder in the service of the Lord, what are you doing? Have we taken our eyes off of the Lord? Are we looking up or are we looking at the problems that roll all around us? It's very easy to do. And Peter saw the boisterous wind and the waves and he began to sink because he took his, his eyes off of Jesus. Could it be that that's what we need today to turn our eyes upon Jesus again? That beautiful song says, Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. So, 
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? Well, there's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. So, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Praise God. A common goal, a unified focus, and now thirdly, a balanced approach. We see this in verses 15 and to 17 of chapter 4. Imagine this. There were some who wanted to do all the fighting. Then there were the people who wanted to do all, all the building. They were scaredy cats. Or maybe they were the engineers. <laughs> there were the bloodthirsty and there were the cowards. Or maybe there were the industrious and there were those who just wanted to pick a fight. Now, Nehemiah is coming to them and saying, there's got to be a balance here. We've got to take it all in turns. There's got to be a circuit. Everybody has to take the role and give the and take the responsibility that I give them. There's got to be a balance in continuing the work of the Lord. You've got to be prepared to fight the sword in one hand and a trowel in the other, and you've got to be prepared to build as well. You see, you meet some Christians and all they want to do is fight. Not just fight with one another, but fight for some cause, some other cause. Alan Redpath says, If Satan gets Christians and Christian people involved in controversy at the expense of capturing souls for Christ, he has secured a master stroke. Men spend their lives in so-called defense of truth and defense of position and neglect the main task of building. They fight over hair-splitting matters of doctrine while souls are perishing. First, a common goal, then a unified focus, and then a balanced approach, and fourthly, and others orientated occupation. Nehemiah encouraged him in verses 19 to 22, and he says, Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Well, what about that? The one thing that Nehemiah was encouraging them to do was to rally around others because God is fighting for you. You can be encouraged, fellow biblical explorer. You are never fighting alone. Hallelujah. Because even if your neighbor is not with you, God is. God is with you. Whenever we are discouraged, often what we want to do is, uh, what we want is the, the support of another Christian. But you, did you ever think of it this way? What people re need, really need when they are encouraged is not the support of another, but to be a support to another. One can easily lose your whole strength, your whole vision, and all your confidence because of the rubbish around you. Can I encourage you this morning and today to do four things? Get a common goal like the Apostle Paul, and says, this one thing I do, and if all else fails, I'm going to do this one thing. Do you know what that is? Well, it's the gospel, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Get a unified focus. Don't look to the other Christians around you. They're going to let you down and let others down. Look to the Lord Jesus, who is never going to let you down and who will fight for you. Get a balanced approach. Don't become one of those issue Christians that stands on a soapbox and won't talk about anything else but that person or that particular thing. Be balanced. And remember that there are souls all around you that are dying. Fourthly, serve others. I think that's the great antidote. Forget about yourself and serve others. So today, where do you see yourself today in the rebuilding of your walls of defense? Are you discouraged? Do you feel defeated? Then turn your eyes once again upon Jesus and look into his full face, his full and glorious face. Bring it to the Lord in prayer and seek his direction in your life. Seek his encouragement today. 
If you want to do that, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am so very tired and discouraged right now. I need you to encourage and strengthen my heart and strengthen my soul. Strengthen me for the continuing work that you have called me to do, Lord Jesus. I am relying on you to see me through right now. And I thank you for your presence, your ongoing presence in my life with me right now. Amen. Now, if you want to know Jesus as your own personal Savior and Lord of your life, then pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I repent of my sins and I ask that you would forgive me. Jesus, be the Lord of my life right now and I will pledge to serve you for the rest of my days. And I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you've prayed these prayers, and even if you haven't, we would love to hear from you. You can con connect with us at our website at sawhitby.ca. There you can leave a confidential email or a comment or a prayer request. We would love to pray with you. We would love to pray for you. May God richly bless you today.